Hey everyone and welcome back to my channel and if you are new here definitely make sure you hit that subscribe button because I do come out with new videos every single week and this week we're going to do another mock narrative so this narrative is on a completely made up patient but it kind of gives you a better idea of how I set up my D chart but today we're going to do a D chart specifically over a patient that's having a STEMI I'll go over some of the things that are important to me whenever I make a D chart over a STEMI patient and hopefully it'll help you whenever you're writing your next report all right guys let's Let's jump right in. So as we know, the D in D chart stands for dispatch, and I tend to include a lot of information in dispatch. I include it from the moment we were dispatched to the moment that we pulled up on scene. I set my D charts up like a story. That part of the story includes from the moment we got the call all the way to the moment that we arrived. For example, in this report, Atlanta's fire station is dispatched to 401 North Washington Avenue, and the reference is to a 58-year-old female experiencing chest pain and shortness of breath. So in my first sentence, I always just include where I'm coming from, the address I'm going to and the age and gender of the patient and what the reference is. Medic 1 goes in route code 3 with 3 personnel. I list the personnel including myself in parentheses. So advanced EMT Jackson, NREMT Johnson, and NRP Stacy. While in route, dispatch advises Medic 1 to don universal precautions because it is unknown if the patient has or has been exposed to COVID-19. So we get this a lot on calls. Um, a lot of times dispatch can't ascertain if the patient has COVID or if they have had COVID. So as a precaution, dispatch will just advise to don universal precautions. Dispatch advises that the only reported medical history is hypertension. Now that doesn't always include all of their medical history. Medic 1 acknowledges upon our arrival, the entire EMS crew dons universal precaution PPE. And where I'm from, universal precaution PPE consists of N95 masks, Tyvek suits or gowns, eye protection, and gloves. EMS is directed into the home and into a back bedroom. So now you're kind of getting a picture of I'm going into the home, I'm probably Probably going through maybe a living room or a kitchen and I'm going into one of the back bedrooms. The patient is found in bed in the semi Fowler's position and she appears in obvious distress. So that's everything from the moment I've gotten toned out to the moment I make patient contact. And then I continue on into the chief complaint. As we know the C stands for chief complaint. So our chief complaint from our actual patient is going to be chest pain and shortness of breath. Then we go into our history section. This is where we obtain our ample and our OPQRST. So going through the ample real quick allergies to penicillin. She's currently on enalapril, which is an ACE inhibitor, probably for her hypertension, which is in her past medical history. Her last oral intake was breakfast and the events leading up to. The patient states she had eaten breakfast and began to have chest pain. She states that she felt like her food had maybe not set well with her because she then vomited. She stated, I've never felt like this. I think I'm dying. Her family then called for EMS. Okay, so now we've got our ample. We'll go to our OPQRST. The onset, what was the patient doing whenever this started? Patient ate breakfast about an hour prior and started to feel indigestion and chest pain. Going into our palliation or our provocation, patient states nothing makes this pain or nausea go away and the pain isn't worsened by anything. The quality of pain. Your patient describes this pain as crushing and the R stands for radiation. Um, does it go anywhere? Does it radiate anywhere? Patient states that the pain radiates from the left side of her chest to the left shoulder and, and the left side of her jaw. The severity of her symptoms, her, the patient rates her pain a 10 out of 10 and the time of the onset of symptoms was about one hour prior. Next is is what we did to assess our patient. So I always start off with mental status. Patient is alert and oriented of person, place, time, and event. And then I go into the ABCs. The patient's airway appears to be patent with no obvious obstructions or excessive secretions. But I do note that she did vomit earlier, but there's no current signs of, of vomit around the mouth or in the airway. Then I go into breathing. The patient appears to be breathing normally and is able to speak in full sentences. Our lung sounds are clear bilaterally. Circulation is next. Our circulation appears to be intact with no obvious external injuries, no obvious external bleeding. However, the patient's radial pulse is noted to be weak. Her skin is noted to be pale and diaphoretic. I obviously include that near circulation because skin color can be a very good indicator of poor or good circulation. The patient is noted to appear extremely tired and uncomfortable, but she is able to follow commands and rates her chest pain a 10 out of 10. So this just paints a little bit of a better picture of how your patient looks and her chest pain is a 10 out of 10. So it was at this time significant 
significant ST elevation is noted on that four lead. So if we know obvious elevation on the four lead, definitely need to be obtaining that 12 lead immediately. Um, with chest pain patients, you may just go straight to the 12 lead as well. The full 12 lead is conducted and ST elevation is noted in leads two, three, and AVF. With reciprocal depression noted in AVL and lead one, EMS suspects a possible inferior myocardial infarction. With these specific types of STEMIs, we want to move V4 over and check for elevation over there. V4 was moved over to check right-sided involvement and ST elevation is noted indicating right-sided involvement. The presence of a first-degree heart block is noted as well. EMS informs the patient that emergent abnormalities are noted to her EKG and then strongly advises the patient to go to the hospital. I know every EMT, every paramedic is different. I choose not to tell the patient that they're having a heart attack. I do choose to tell them that I, I do see some abnormalities on the 12 lead. That's just a personal choice. I do allow the ER physician to explain to them what is going on because at that point they're at a higher level of care and if something goes wrong and that patient has a panic attack or anxiety attack and it exacerbates their situation, they have more medications, they have basically higher level of care. I do tell the patient at this time that emergent abnormalities are noted. She agrees to be transported via ambulance. This is always important. You don't want to take a patient against their will. Lastly, the hospital is given a call as EMS is loading the patient into the ambulance in order to alert them of the STEMI and to stay ready for radio report. Now, every EMS provider is different. This isn't like a requirement of paramedics or EMTs, but when we have a patient that's that serious, and if you have the help, I know my local department runs with a three-man ambulance. Some run with more or less, and this isn't possible, but many times we will call call them from the scene, let them know what we're bringing in. But like I said, this isn't set in stone. This is just something that I've seen many EMS providers do. And the next section is the treatment section. So I always start the treatment section with the patient assessment has been performed because that is technically a treatment. And if you need to know what was assessed and what the findings of the assessment were, you can go ahead and look in the section above. But vitals are taken and R is recorded. And through the charting system that I use, vitals are in a totally different section. So I did go ahead and put in parentheses they can be found in the vitals section. I really only include vitals if the vital is so abnormal that I, I feel the need to mention it. Otherwise, I'll just say vitals are taken and are as recorded and they can just go ahead and take a look in the vitals section. Patient is noted to be hypotensive with a blood pressure of 90 over 50. So that was significant enough to me that I went ahead and I mentioned it in the treatment section. A four lead is obtained and abnormalities are noted. A 12 lead is obtained and a possible right-sided inferior myocardial infarction is noted. The patient is placed on oxygen at 2 liters per minute and the initial SpO2 is 90%. The patient is placed onto the gurney via the sheet and all seat belts are applied. So I tell you how the patient was loaded onto the gurney and that my partners and I applied all the seat belts and that's just covering yourself and making sure that your patient is safely secured on the gurney because accidents do happen on the ambulance. The patient is then loaded into the ambulance. 325 milligrams of aspirin are administered and that's obviously because the patient is complaining of chest pain. Bilateral 18 gauges are established to the left and right forearm. Patency is ensured with a 10 milliliter flush of normal saline. There is no redness, tenderness, or inflammation noted to the site, uh, which just further confirms that it's a patent line. A full blood draw is obtained from one IV site. If your hospital does this and you're able to get this blood draw before you get there, that will help them tremendously because especially on a STEMI patient, the first thing that they're going to want to do is run labs. So they're going to want to know troponin levels and all that other stuff and a basic rainbow blood draw will help them tremendously. 50 micrograms of fentanyl are given for pain control. 450 milliliters of normal saline are administered from a 1,000 milliliter bag. Nitroglycerin is withheld from this patient due to the confirmed right-sided involvement. In my protocol, nitroglycerin is completely contraindicated on an inferior MI that has right-sided involvement. And I went ahead and noted the blood glucose level at 168. And going into the transport section, in this section, I just go ahead and include any Anything that went down in the ambulance. If we went non-emergent, if we went emergent, code one, code three, that sort of thing. If we ended up upgrading or downgrading in route to the hospital. Patient is transported code three to Atlantis General Hospital. Patient's condition is monitored and reassessed during transport with deterioration noted. The patient does become less responsive. AGH, meaning Atlantis General Hospital, is contacted and a radio report is given and findings of the 12 lead are relayed to the ER physician. The ER physician is also advised that EMS has transmitted the 12 lead to them. They are advised of the patient's condition, treatment, and our estimated time of arrival. Medical direction does advise EMS to report to the cath lab and that staff will be waiting for their arrival. Upon arrival to AGH, we are directed to the cath lab and a verbal report is given to RN Jessica Smith, at which time the patient's care is turned over to AGH. Many times whenever a patient has a STEMI, I'll go ahead and
ahead and give report to them as well because it's a more critical patient. So report is given to the ER physician as well. Medic one is cleaned, restocked, and returned to Atlantis Fire Station. And that's pretty much all I include in the transport section. So that is my D chart. I typically don't include the E, which is for exceptions. Many people do D, C, H, A, R, T, E. I just tend to not do E. If there are any exceptions, I usually end up including it elsewhere in the D chart. So let's look at the total report altogether. And this would be kind of how the whole report looks. My STEMI reports tend to be a little bit longer. My critical patients tend to be a little bit longer. That's pretty much all there is to a STEMI narrative. Everybody's different. They approach their D chart. Um, some of them use soap. Some of them will just make one big long paragraph and explain everything that happened from the start of the call to the end of the call. It just kind of depends how you were trained, what your service requires, and things like that. But also I was going to tell you at the very bottom you can see I've signed it. I put my employee identification number and I've also put my national registry level. And just so you know all of this stuff can be subpoenaed to the court and that is why it is so important to spell check and proofread your reports. That's pretty much all I have for you. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm definitely going to do another one of these. I don't know if it'll be next week or the following but the next one I do is going to be a code report. So a report or narrative over a cardiac arrest. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you next week. Bye!